I'm focusing on this diagram here from someone on, in Mount Scott Crater Lake, Oregon, taking an angle to Mount Shasta, California. The person in Mount Scott was 8,934 feet high. Mount Shasta is 14,179 feet. They're 105 miles away. And the extra height of Mount Shasta above Mount Scott is 5,245 feet. But they took a dip angle to the perspective size of Mount Shasta. And for some reason or another, to them that meant that it was gone over or cut. I think they were expecting to bring a straight line out here and when, and the straight line from the theodolite would meet Mount Shasta about here in a straight line, right? Now, that is what's happening, but because of perspective, things appear to be slanted down. They're not actually slanted, they just appear that way. The only way they're going to get an angle up to the top of Mount Shasta is that if both mountains don't angularly change in size, but this person expected Mount Shasta to not change in angular size. So if you go out taking angles and angular sizes and you accept that when a car drives away from you, it changes in angular size, or when you move away from a high object, it changes in angular size, that is the end of globe earth. So Brian says that the only way this observer will get an angle up to the top of Mount Shasta is if both mountains don't change in angular size. And why would they change in size? Both mountains are fixed heights, there's a fixed distance between them, and the observer isn't going anywhere. Nothing is changing. So the expected angle to the top of Mount Shasta in the flat earth scenario will be what it says it is, 0.542 degrees. If Mount Scott was closer to Mount Shasta, then the angle would be greater. And if it was farther away, it would be less. But Mount Scott doesn't move, and it's exactly where it always is. So how is it then that this observer ended up looking down to the top of a taller mountain when taking the measurement in reality? It's just not possible on a flat Earth. So let's test this out by writing something to scale in 3D for both flat and globe scenarios, and I'll try and explain what each line does as we go. So let's start off then by defining three variables for the flat Earth scenario. There'll be M, Shasta, and Scott. M will be the number of feet in a mile. Shasta will be the height of the mountain, and so will Scott. Next, we're going to need a plane to put all our points on. If you can think of a point in space consisting of an x, a y, and a z value, then z equals zero produces a plane of points whose z values are all zero. Next, I want to place a point in this plane that will represent the base of Mount Shasta, and notice that this plane is called F. Next, I'd like to create a point on this plane for the base of Mount Scott. And ideally, that wants to be 105 miles from A. But I'd like to have the ability of making that distance variable. So let's create a slider which starts at 5 miles from A to 105 miles from A. And we can vary that in 5 mile increments. and notice that this slider has been called A. So how can we ensure that a new point on this plane is exactly this slider distance away from point A? Well, one method would be to create a circle around point A with a radius of lowercase a, and then place a point on that circle. Now I'd like to create two more points for both mountaintops that retain the x and the y values of the bases, but the z values will now equal to these variables in miles.
For the next point we want to think about the observer over on the top of Mount Scott and they'll be wanting to establish a horizontal with their theodolite so that they can measure the angle to the top of Mount Shasta. Now that horizontal will intersect the mountain here between points A and C and that will be at the same height as Mount Scott. So let's do that. Well that's all the points added, now we'll display all the results. Well that's all the information added and I think you'll agree that all the heights on the mountains are correct. What we don't have correct at the moment is the distance between the mountains. It's currently 15 miles. We want that to be 105 miles. The angle currently is 3.78 degrees to the top of Mount Shasta and that's from the top of Mount Scott. So we can stretch this out and we can make it 105 using this slider. So let's spread them out and see what angle we get there. It's 0.542 degrees and that's in agreement with the illustration. Now mountains are fixed objects and this is how it's always going to be on a flat earth. It's never going to change. Let's move on to the globe scenario. So I've already taken the liberty of creating the three variables that we had earlier, together with the slider for which I can vary the distance between Mount Shasta and Mount Scott. And as this is the globe scenario, it would be remiss of me if I didn't include refraction. So let's create another slider for the refraction coefficient. Unlike the flat scenario, this time we're going to need a radius. So let's create another variable for r, which also takes the refraction coefficient into account. Now we need a surface to put our points on, and instead of creating a sphere where it's difficult to zoom in on, we'll use a function instead that lets us create just a small section of a spherical surface. So what we're looking at now is a very small part of the sphere. It looks pretty flat, doesn't it? And what this equation does is it spits out all the z values for all points based on the x's and y's. So in the case where x is 0 and y is 0, then the value for z would be this number here squared and then square rooted, i.e. just this number. And if you run through all possible combinations of x and y, then the result would be a surface resembling a sphere. So now I'm ready to place a point on this surface for the base of Mount Shasta. And I'll also create a ray, which is a line, that will run from the centre of the sphere through the point, and that will represent the vertical or plumb for that location.
So what the word flat means in the context of flat earth isn't anything to do with a plane with no thickness. Rather, it's just a way of saying that all verticals are parallel to one another, and if verticals are parallel, then all horizontals, which are the perpendiculars to those verticals, are also parallel to one another. This isn't the case for the globe because here, all verticals have their own unique direction, as do the horizontals, or perpendiculars to those verticals. Now I don't need to see this ray, but I will need to use it quite often, so I'm just going to hide it for now. Next we want to create a point on the surface that will represent the base of Mount Scott, and this isn't quite as easy as creating a simple circle around point A with the radius of this lowercase s. And that's because the surface curves in all directions. To create this circle, we'll need to slice through the sphere with a plane that is perpendicular to this ray. And we'll need to cut through that ray in just the right spot. And it turns out that spot is related to the cosine of the central angle that is formed at the center of the sphere by the verticals of each mountain. So now we're ready to create the points that represent the tops of both mountains. And the easiest way to do this is by intersecting the vertical rays A and B with their own spheres that are centered at the origin. And those spheres will have a radius of R plus the mountain height in miles. Our last point is going to be somewhere along this ray, and we'll find it by placing a plane that's perpendicular to this ray at point D. So the last thing I want to do before I create an information text box is to write a line to detect whether the top angle is dipping or not. Okay, so which scenario do you think was the easiest? The flat scenario or the globe one? Well, let's have a look at these values. This looks correct for Mount Shasta. This looks correct for Mount Scott. Currently, we're at 15 miles 
between the mountains that's correct and we currently have a top angle of just over three and a half degrees from Mount Scott to Mount Shasta so let's separate these let's go 105 miles that way and there's no refraction just yet okay so now we've got a different angle it's a dip angle this time of 0 0.21813 degrees now if you remember the angle that the observer had on the original illustration that Brian brought that was a dip angle of 0 0.10681 degrees now we can try and recreate that by moving this coefficient this way so let's try it let's see if we can find that angle so we're getting closer oh that's nearly there isn't it so we just want this to be 10681 let's see if I can use the keyboard wrong way there we go so these were the conditions on the day so this was the refraction factor on the day which is very close I think to 7 over 6 yeah it's not too far away and as you can see so we've got a dip angle here and that means the observer has to look down on the much taller mountain to measure it and what's the difference in feet? Well, it's about 1,034 feet. When, that's, when that line of sight came out from the theodolite, it actually was meeting Mount Shasta at this point. But they think, right, they think, because they're not thinking straight, that it's going over the top of Mount Shasta. When it's not going over the top of Mount Shasta, your straight line out is still hitting Mount Shasta here. It just doesn't appear that way from with the naked eye because of perspective. It would appear that the line is coming down at an angle. So this dip angle is wrong because the, there was no need for that to be put in. This line here, right, this horizontal line out from the third light was meeting Mount Shasta at this point. It's just due to perspective, it didn't appear that way. It appeared to the person that they were looking up higher than they really were. They were not. They weren't doing that. They were actually meeting Mount Shasta at this point. But because Mount Shasta had an angular size of 1.46 degrees, it appeared, appeared, apparent, appeared, not actual, appeared. Take this in, borders, appeared. It wasn't actual. A-P-P-E-A-R-E-D. Appeared to be different. Okay? Because the surface of the globe is curving away equally in all directions, the horizontal that was established by the observer's theodolites at point D extends far above the top of the much taller Mount Shasta. Without any refraction, that's to say there isn't any atmosphere for light to bend in, the intersection point at E is much higher. But gradually increasing this coefficient will make it appear to the observer that Mount Shasta is gaining in height, lessening to some extent the effect of curvature. Well I think I'll end this video here as it's gone on long enough now. Not quite as long as Brian's 47 minute marathon this was in response to. You'll find his video linked in the description and I'll also link this playlist which has got a couple of unlisted tutorials in it. Just want to say thanks very much to Where's Wally for sending his army my way and don't forget to hit the like Drop me a comment on what you thought about this video. Thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you later.